Hello everyone, this is Gary Marr from Window Community College. This screen capture is from my SAS 121AB Microsoft Command Line Operations class. This particular screen capture is specifically dedicated to the topics covered in Module 6, Media and Miscellaneous Commands. Now, what I've done in Modules 3, 4, 5, and 6 is break up the commands available at the command line in the different categories. Now, I did that based on some readings I did on how other people had broken up the commands and also I put my own personal English on this by moving some of the commands around and also in particular the commands that are highlighted uh, on these PowerPoint slides are commands which I think are especially useful. There are a lot of other commands here that I have not listed in any of these modules. Uh, I think I made a, uh, a statement earlier in maybe the, the third module. There's actually a Microsoft uh, free text on uh, the command line language that's almost a thousand pages long. When you start including ActiveX, uh, servers, uh, the internet, networking into this equation, this can become a very long <clears throat> class and a very long list of commands. We're only working with a subset of those commands. This particular subset is the smallest one so far. Basically what this talks to is those commands which are going to deal with the media that you're using, primarily a hard drive, and what you would do to maintain it, create it, and initialize it. Uh, I would be careful with some of these commands in that when you're issuing some of them, they could have consequences if you're running them on a server or a device which is large and shared among multiple users. When you're experimenting, which I encourage you to do with all these commands, you might want to try some of these exclusively on a PC at first, get the hang of it, and always do a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, question what class slash question mark is help to understand how that command works. I've also given you ample links and videos inside the Canvas shell that will hopefully help you uh, find all the information you need to experiment with each one of these commands moving forward. Here is my list of highlighted commands. Um, there's not many of them, and uh, some of these commands are actually built into the operating system and run on their own, so you probably won't have much of a need to run them yourself, but you know, they're, they're all part of that command list, so we're going to cover them. I've also created a script file like I have in earlier modules that talk about these highlighted commands and some of the syntax you might want to try to use them. The first two, check disk and defrag, based on drive technology and some of the new functions built into the newer operating systems let's say Windows 7 and beyond, they have become less important and you're less likely to run them. In fact, I don't think check disk is even necessary to run at all anymore because of one, the reliability of the drives, and two, because there are certain things that will happen in the course of running your PC in the back room or the operating system will do a quick check to make sure the drive is okay. Back in the bad old days when hard drives first made their appearance, it was possible if you were rough with a PC you could cause a jarring motion and then a hard disk uh, read-write head could touch the surface of the disk and bad spot it, making that spot unusable um, to store or retrieve data. What check disk would do would we look for these particular problems, fix them if they could, or give you some indication of the condition of that disk and its usability. Defrag is also something that happens in the background, although you could issue this command if you felt that things had gotten a little bit um, fragmented, uh, especially if you're working with a disk drive that you know is pretty much filled and you really don't have a lot of files you can delete from it. What uh, defrag is or fragmentation is, is that if you have a full hard drive where all of the drive is pretty much filled up, you end up having spots in that drive or spaces in that drive to store information that aren't very large. So maybe if you had a file that was 10 megabytes, it would have to store two megabytes in one area of the drive, another megabyte in another area of a drive, another part of the drive would have four megabytes, and et cetera, until you got to ten. And that's because the drive is fragmented. It doesn't have a continuous area, a contiguous area that would hold all ten megabytes of information. What defragmentation does <clears throat> is it looks for these fragments and basically removes them and rewrites uh, that empty space into a larger block that's available to send files to, therefore eliminating the fragmentation of the larger file. That's something that's taken here by the operating system, but I suspect if you were 
working with an environment where your PC was very large, or excuse me, that the PC had most of the information taken up, then you might want to initiate a defragmentation outside of its normal cycle. Partitioning um, a drive has a lot to do with uh, old school stuff again, where when the first hard drives made their parents, everybody was so used to dealing with floppy drives that in many times, in many cases, they would try to create a situation where the hard drive was uh, essentially split into pieces. Part of it would be the C drive, part of it would be the VDD drive, part of it could be an F drive. It could be used for backup purposes. It could be used for uh, just splitting an application. Less important today, given the price, the cost of storage alternatives, especially flash drives and solid state drives, it's probably less important now than it once was. Labels. Um, a label is simply the ability to be able to put a volume label or a name on a drive. Um, this can be important in terms of uh, perhaps administering a large set of drives where there could be a smart name or a smart number included in the volume name, which would be helpful in terms of supporting that environment. Um, typically, your drive will come with a volume label on it and may or may not be something you want to change. In fact, we can look at one real quick here. If I type in label, it's going to tell me the label. Oh, it's going to let me set the label first. Uh, let's not do that yet. No, we do not want to delete the current label. At this point, this is a great example about um, how I've, I've warned you guys to make sure that you put a, a slash question mark to get help because when I issued the label command, my anticipation was since I don't use this command often, I would get actually the name of the label. But when in fact what it did do is it allowed me to change the label by walking me through a series of prompts. And I can also change the label directly by typing in the command. What I should have done first is type in the vol command, which would tell me that the name of this volume is OS. Your volume could be, uh, quite often I change mine to my initials and then what particular machine it is. But again, this is not something most people do a whole lot with, which is, I guess, probably the reason I'd forgotten how to actually just display the label name in itself. Back to our list of commands. Um, I did forget format. That's an important one. Be very careful with format. Um, for the most part, uh, since enough people have gotten burned with this over the years, there's a number of prompts that will come up to make sure that what you want to do is format a particular piece of media. Um, I will format, obviously, things like USB drives, but there should be no need to format my hard drive unless I intend on cleaning it completely and uh, I'm not using it again because format will, in fact, wipe that particular media clean of anything. Uh, back in the bad old days, uh, it was possible for people who weren't careful to format their hard drive and wipe the operating system and all the files that went with it off of it. Uh, that was one thing you learned once and probably never did again. Um, let's see, what else we got in our hit parade here? Um, mode has to do with the ports in the PC. Again, that's one that, again, it's a very specialized command. If you had a device that you were connecting to your PC that was somewhat unique, more of an engineering type of um, mechanism, you might have to have to set the settings to connect to a COM port or some port on your PC. This is something which is, again, kind of old school. Most of the stuff now would be USB and probably be done a different way. Uh, Verify is, again, a little old school, but essentially it would help you in terms of determining uh, if, in fact, files get put into your disk. Vol, I just showed you, displays the disk volume and volume name. One of the things that, or one of the commands that we have in this particular um, category called media miscellaneous which i'm not inclined to believe is probably the best place for it in retrospect is the for command the for command is one to let you iterate through a list of files looking for a particular option and then if that option is found doing something as a result of it so for example what i have here is it basically loops through um uh the uh, current folder looking for files that have an extension of uh, doc or text. If it finds those files, those files are stored in a variable. That's what the percent F is in a batch file. 
and then it's going to, if it finds one of those at the end, basically display the contents of that file with a type command. This probably is more appropriate, and we're going to see this a lot more when we cover batch files, but it's not a bad thing to, to maybe hit on it now a little bit, uh, knowing that we're going to see a lot more of it uh, as things uh, move on. Prompt. Um, this was something that um, was a big deal when it first happened years ago. And essentially what the first DOS computers did is they would only give you the drive letter on the prompt. And then it became possible to give you a drive letter. Actually, I don't think they gave you the drive. It just gave you the, um, uh, the, the right pointing uh, greater than symbol. And then it allowed you to basically customize the prompt with a prompt command. And if you put prompt space uh, dollar sign P dollar sign G, what you got was the drive letter and also the folder that you're currently in. And as you can imagine, as you're navigating through this particular hard drive with the different DOS commands, it was helpful to know that you'd gotten where you thought you were and that you were issuing a command that was going to work because the files that you were um, trying to to manipulate or call were in that particular folder. That was kind of a big deal when it first came out. Registry is also another one of those commands that probably larger than life. The other one that's like this is the net command. There's a whole series of uh, subcommands associated with this. Registry is kind of a funny thing. You want to be careful with it because basically what happens in a lot of installs is registry entries are created, they're changed, they're maintained, and if you try to override some of those entries, you could find that software that once worked perfectly might not work at all anymore. So there's other tools, RegEdit is one of those that comes with the operating system, which are better for actually making changes to the registry. But uh, I think the one command I left there was the query command, along with the slash question mark to show you that reg was the command query was the subcommand, and then slash uh, question mark would show you all of the various things that it could do. Well, that kind of kind of covers it, I guess, for the DOS command line commands. Uh, this was the last section on that. And essentially what we're going to do next here is in Module 7, <coughs> excuse me, move directly into batch files. And what batch files are going to do for us is let us take these commands that we're issuing at the command line, put them inside a text file, and then instead of having to type the commands again, just simply put the text file name with a .bat extension on the command line and run it. Now, what I've done is throughout the modules, I've put as optional items different little batch files that you could look at. Um, we're going to spend a fair amount of time in the next module going through a couple of those that I had placed out there earlier, just for you earlier, just to look at. But now we're going to go through them in more detail. I think this is really, for a lot of the uh, system support people who are taking this class, is really where the money is for you guys, because there's going to be a lot of times where you're going to have the set sequence of commands you're going to have to run on one or more PCs or servers. And if you can store this information in a batch file, it's going to save you time. And also make the operation a much higher quality because you know it's getting run the same way every time. All right, that's it for this one. Give me a call if you have any questions. Send me an email. Stop by my office. Thank you.